So, South Luangwa, I've been privileged enough to, as uh, so far as to South Luangwa, for the last uh, three, going on four years. And the itinerary, like we do with many of the destinations, it changes sort of every couple of years. We'll, we'll try and change it and try and sort of like perfect it as much as we as much as we possibly can. And I really do think you know the, the itinerary that I'm going to be showing you um, now, which is the one that we will be doing, we would have been doing for this year and then for the foreseeable future. I really think it really gives you the best that South Luangwa has to offer. So. We uh, we use three camps. The first camp is a uh, Nsefu camp. Second one is Kahingo. The third one, which we've added, Fui Lodge. So I think it's a great combination. The, the, the three of them, it's three incredible concessions that you can um, you can drive in. Um, and I'm going to be telling you a little bit more uh, as to why they're so incredible. Right. So first place from Johannesburg. So if you, if you guys have been following some of my webinars in the past, you know that I'm a big fan of arriving at a destination and together as a group the day before the safari actually happens. And I think this gives you um, a great opportunity to sit and have dinner together and discuss some of the plans, you know, for the, for the coming days. And also kind of what to expect. It just, it, I think it gets that excitement going, whereas if you land and you go on straight on safari, like first of all, you have to try and get to sort of like meet everyone. And it's, it's a little bit chaotic, but this really gives you time to um, to relax, settle in. And also if, if you like granted any camera from us, then you know we can sort it out there and then. And you can also make sure that all your batteries are charged, all of these things. So I'm a big fan, we'll all um, arrive at uh, Nusaka the day before the safari starts. This is all included in the in the price. We'll have a nice dinner together, nice early dinner, um, and then we'll stay. We'll be staying at the Pratia Hotel, which is um, these photos that you can see. Here. Very nice hotel. It's it's not too far from the airport. Maybe about a twenty minute drive, um, and very comfortable. You know, it's it's got everything that you need. It's got air conditioning. There's there's a pool upstairs, uh, with a beautiful restaurant. So really everything that you need to. Um, in a hotel, like I said, the perfect way to just get together and give each other the plans for the coming days before the safari actually kicks off. And then from from there on, we'll catch a we'll, we try and catch an early morning flight. So this is like quite a thing because it's often like dependent on the days. You know, early flight early morning on certain days, and then the availability of the lodges is also dependent on those days. So. We try and make sure that when we book, we book on the days to get the earliest flight out as we can. But if not, then the latest flight is about sort of 10 30, between 10 30 and 12. All right, so we fly from, um, from Lusaka, we fly into Mfui Airport. It's about an hour and a half flight. And then from there, we'll drive to Nsefu Camp, which is probably like another hour and a half to two hour drive into Camp here. Now, the drive is, is, is quite an interesting one because the Mfui airport is, is in the Mfui town. So it's like a dirt runway that like you get to in a lot of the lodges, you know, where you, in the park. So you, you start off driving through these little villages. You see people with their little spaza shops on the side of the road. You'll be driving um, in open and then get into the confluence. Um, and then you'll start entering the... Uh, the Nsefu sector, which um, is a few camps in there. It's a private sector, and that's what we'll be doing the majority of our game viewing. But for, we'll get to Nsefu camp for lunch, introduction to the camp, and as you see from here, we will be on the river in South Luangwa, especially during the dry season. Now, um, I've been going to South Luangwa, and I've been there in July, um, and also in um, October. October for me is by far the best time of the year to go. It is very, very hot. I mean, the temperatures can get to like sort of late 30s, maybe early 40s degrees Celsius. But the game being, it's dry. So all the signal water holes dry and everything comes down to that Luangwa River. And it is, with your camp being right on the, on the edge of the river there, you're right in the thick of the action. 
Okay. And the the camps in South Luangwa and probably in Zambia as a whole, it, it, it's changing a little bit now. I see that there are some companies that are going the, the super, super luxury route, which I think kind of loses that, that essence of and the beauty of South Luangwa. I love like the, the camps that we've chosen. Um, in Sefu camp, it's very comfortable, uh, but it's it's a, like a we call them rondavos or chalets, um, and it, it's still got that traditional feel of uh, of a safari going. You know, it's, with, with everything that you need. So, like I mentioned, it gets very very hot in October, but they've got these. They call it, so it works like an air conditioning, but it, like a water box, um, water behind your bed that just goes over your bed so you've essentially got air conditioning but just over your bed which is phenomenal you know especially like during the the hot time of the year i can't sleep when it's really really hot so i mean these things it is incredible it is really comfortable um and like the rest of the room i think i've got photos of the inside of the room very very comfortable and um, spacious and just simple but like essentially everything that you need the other thing that I love about the camps in Zambia, and it's, um, I don't know if many, maybe some, some lodges in Botswana do it, but they still serve coffee around the fire um, at the camp, which for me, I, I love that. You know, you, you, so you, you go down early in the morning, and I, I try and get them maybe even like in a half an hour, an hour before any of the guests come down, because it is, it is so beautiful. And um, the guys are still setting up, they start a fire, they've got coffee going on a kettle, they'll do like toast on little grids. It's spectacular. They do sometimes get a bit carried away with like eggs and porridge and things like that, which just delays your, your game viewing time, obviously. So we'll try and sort of grab a quick snack, quick bite to eat, and, and then we head out because, like I mentioned, it does get very hot. So by like 9, 30, 10 o'clock, most of the animals are in the shade and, and sleeping. So you want to try and get out there first thing in the morning, and um, and maximize the the cooler times of the year. That's the the sort of bar and lounge area. Again, very very comfortable. You know, we um, there are plug points in the rooms where you can charge your your laptops. And then we'll often sit around these tables here during the day. And um, heat permitting, obviously, the, the laptops do take take a bit of a beating in that heat. And um, but then we can you can process your images there. We can work through Lightroom and from like from the the lounge area looking to the left you're overlooking that beautiful Luangwa River and it's simply spectacular it really really is pretty um they've also got like a little hide right at the back to be honest I haven't really used it much I'll be like telling you as we go why we don't use that hide in particular all that much but it is there is available so sometimes if like if herds of elephants come through you know it is maybe worth stopping there, watching them go and uh, go and have a drink. Okay, now that in CFO sector, it is, anything can happen in that place. It, it really is. For me, it's still probably one of the wildest places in Africa that's left. You know, like another place that comes up is Chitaki Springs. It's still got that, that wildness to it. And, and you can see it when you look at the lions. You can see with, with this male... They, they're not your sort of big main lines that you get in East Africa or in the Kalahari. Very small mains, but just like vicious looking faces and vicious eyes. And during the, these dry times of the year, they take down big prey. So buffalo, um, hippos, giraffes, and even young elephants sometimes. So these... Like, two buffalo kills in two days which um which is quite phenomenal it, it really is spectacular so that's for me another reason why um, i like going in the during the dry months it can be harsh it can be very harsh you know seeing animals um being probably at their weakest you know a lot of the uh, the grazers you know the, there's hardly any grass left which from a game being point of view makes it a lot a lot easier to see things but your grazers do do tend to suffer a bit more during these times of the year, obviously. Yeah, again, you can see um, big, like big prides as well. Like in the past, you know, prides of 
15, 18 lines together. Um, and most of it, like this as well, all along the Luangwa River, which is, again, like you saw those photos, that's where our camp is, that's where the action happens. And I mean, look at that, the river is, is simply spectacular. It really, really is pretty to, to cruise around there. Like from, from um, in Sefu side, you can't really get down onto the, onto the um, sort of water level. But our next camp, Kainga, you can get you can get a bit closer. There are some like steep steep drop offs and things that you you can't get down from the other side. <clears throat> and this, I mean, this was also again at um, at Nsef when one of the it was our second or third morning um, a couple of years ago, where we found sort of with two lionesses following this this buffalo bull, and it was getting hot. It was about nine thirty in the morning. And I said to my guests, I mean, there's, there's no way it's getting hot. And true spot, they like started chasing after a few of these dugger boys. And this guy just stopped to look around for a few seconds and started off with, with two lionesses. And I think they ended up being 12 or 14, just arriving left, right, and center. As those, um, as those distress calls started coming through, the other, um, the other lions started joining up and and taking it down. And for me, this was the first time I've personally witnessed the whole sort of takedown. Um, it's something I've always wanted to see. It, it is very difficult to watch, I won't lie, but it's, it's wild. It's that, it's that kind of, the, the, I think the expectation is the right word, I think. It's like when you, when you view those lines, there's a, there's a sense of expectation that they're gonna do something incredible. If you just stick with them, now, if they're hungry, they're going to take down something big. You just got to have to have the patience, stick with them, and um, and you'll be rewarded. And then, of course, leopard in South of the Wangwa, as as I mentioned in the beginning, simply incredible. It's it's known as the Valley of Leopards, but I also think you know maybe sometimes we go with a little bit too much of a um, too, too high expectations almost. It's not like you get them around every single corner. We often joke, as we do with the Sabi sand, that the leopard fall out of trees there. But I've had like a few sort of quieter spells, you know, like similar to the Sabi sands, you can go for a day or two without seeing leopard. And the nice thing in, um, in South Angola as well is there are quite a few um, troops of baboons, there are monkeys there, and very good general game as well. So generally, your um, those prey species will give away the presence of these of these leopards. Um, like with any any place, you know, if, you, if you find um, a female with a cub or um, an individual with a kill, it's a lot easier to then follow up with them and stay with them every single day. Whereas if you get a male that's just sort of cruising through this territory is a good chance he'll be in and out of there the next day. You know, it's very much, um, I won't say luck of the, um, luck of the draw is always, always part of game viewing, but I think your chances here of seeing leopard is higher than a lot of other places, just because of the, the sheer dense population. I think it's a uh, leopard that South of the has got some of the highest densities in the world. So it, yeah, it doesn't get that reputation for, for no reason, that's for sure. Then these guys, also um, a big, big, big attraction. Um, and another reason why you want to visit there during October. So these guys, when it starts sort of, I think it's about February, March, they'll start moving towards uh, North Africa where they, they migrate north. And then from about sort of end of September, beginning of October, they'll start coming back down south again. The river. Now from Nsefu, there is a place um, or a couple of places where you can photograph them from the uh, sort of side on, where you can lie on the ground. There, there's no hide or anything. It's just from the ground, you photograph them. And I mean, they, they in their thousands. So it sounds and looks a lot easier than what it actually is. I promise you that. It's, they, they, they come and go at such great speeds. And I think that the best thing to do often in, when photographing these particular birds is just to focus on one spot and wait for the action to happen there. Because if you try and follow these birds wherever they're going, I mean, it's, 
you're going to be dizzy often and it's it's going to be super super frustrating because i mean the speeds at which that travel is is really crazy it's a lot of fun but yeah very very challenging and it's definitely something that we focus on at least um one or two of the mornings during the trip okay so we'll spend um four nights at nsefu and then from nsefu we do a short little drive in the morning so we'll pack our bags and everything do a short little drive and then you can see it's on the other side of the river we will do a little canoe trip the guys from Kahinga will pick us up in a little um, canoe and we'll canoe across the river and then do a drive up to Kahinga camp. So it's quite a, again, quite an old school way of, of doing the transfers and it's, it's something that I really love. It's, I think we, we've, become, we've become so fancy with like a lot of the, the ways of doing safari that like these back to sort of ground, to ground roots almost, if that makes sense. It really is um, super refreshing and part of why I love Zambia so much. Uh, Kaingo um, used to be three and four nights. We've now changed it to five nights um, just because there's so much to do. The, again, incredible game viewing area. We've also got a number of heights which we make use of, which um, I'm going to be sharing with you in just a little bit. These are um, sort of, as far as the little bit uh, sort of lower resolutions from, from the website, but a little bit more fancier almost in a way, the, the rooms, but still away from the rustic sort of bush experience. So these um, um, roofs here, and then you've got the traditional thatch roof with then um, cement walls. Again, the, the dining room area, thatch, like beautiful old wood, which um, is, is spectacular. And it's, again, it's a small thing. So a lot of these, well, not a lot of these, all of these lodges focus on your, your game being as being the, the main reason why you're there. So there won't be a case that we have to get back to the lodge now because it's nine o'clock and there's breakfast waiting for us. Now, if there's something amazing happening, and if the sort of heat allows, you can stay out for a little bit longer and maximize your game viewing time. I think that's, that's probably the only advantage about going there during the winter months, July, maybe August, is you can do full days out in the field then, whereas in October, highly unlikely, unless you get you know, incredible sighting like lions feeding on something big during the heat of the day at the river, then of course you can stay, stay out and these guys will be more than happy to bring breakfast or lunch or anything through to you, wherever you may be. So that, that's, you know, I think that's the, the, the core of, um, about the experience is the, the game being and the, the, the safari aspect around it. But they've also created like the magical food and service part in it as well, which just takes that whole experience to the next level. <clears throat> Again, you're on the water. So, you know, the amount of times in the east we hear leopard or lions calling, it's quite a lot. Um, there you can see this is a spread sort of like afternoon tea. Um, so they do feed you a lot like they do at, at most of the lodges, the breakfast and lunch, afternoon tea, and then dinner. So as you can see by the snacks, a rustic kind of lodge, but still sort of first class food and service. Um, and like, I mean, to, to sit here during the day, I'm, it's incredible, the amount of bird life coming down here. You can see the water levels by this stage, this is most likely sort of towards the end of October. The water levels in, in this part is quite low, whereas we go down towards there's a little bit of water. And just finish, I just love this video of the elephants. Just have a look at this. Beautiful. You can see the hide at the sort of back left. Beautiful. Like almost daily, you get these elephants coming down. They come and have a drink, move through the river. You can see there's a hippo there. So it's just a, like abundance of, of wildlife and also incredible diversity as well. You'll notice also a lot of the elephants don't have tusks. 
again, that particular area of poaching has been um, a problem sort of over like in the early years, the early 80s, 90s, um, whereas now it's, it's a lot more controlled and um, a lot of, sort of anti-poaching teams present, but a lot of those big tuskers, unfortunately, have been, have been shot out. If I'm not mistaken, I think that is, that's the hippo hide, if I'm not mistaken, which you can see at the back left there. So incredible to spend time with, um, with the elephants. And you almost like, if you don't know where to go, just head down to the river. Late, um, late afternoon, early morning, midday, any time of the day, there's, there's going to be something happening there. It's such a, such a big, um, big source of life. Again, lions at Kahinga also have very good numbers. And the, what I also love about Zambia actually is the, the level of guiding that, that you have there. You know, I think if you take um, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and I think South Africa, I think those three are on par. Of course, you know, even South Africa and any of those three countries, you know, you do have some lodges which emphasize a little bit more on their guiding than others, and you can have a, a bad guide at a lodge. But for the, the three lodges that we've chosen, we really try to make sure that we get the best possible guides available to us. And there's, there's a few guys, there's Patrick at Kango, who's probably like the best, um, one of the best guides I've, I've ever been with. But, you know, because he's that good, he's also in, in high demand. So we, we try and get him for, for every single departure that we go on, but it's not always possible. You know, like sometimes the guy has to go and leave as well and, and see his family. But whenever possible, we really try and go out of our way to get some of these guys that have grown up in the Luangwa Valley in the many years. It's, it's just a know that. Yeah, in the morning, they'll tell you done. And it's like this whole story that unfolds in front of you. And I think that's a lot of these guys, all the guides, you know, back in the day, if you, uh, Derek Shenton, who owns Kahingo, he was, he was a guide sort of, oh, I think it was probably. No, no, can everybody hear me? <laughs> Sorry, I'm not sure what happened there. Sorry, guys. My internet just bombed out for a second. Um, let me go back to where I was. Okay, can everybody see this? Okay. Perfect. Sorry about that. So, um, I can't remember what was, the, what was the last thing I said. Um, yeah, the, the guides. So we try and, we try and request um, the best sort of guides that are available and, you know, try and obviously maximize the, the experience for our clients and, and really try and the, those guides make such a big difference. But with guys like Derek and a lot of the owners who were guides previously, they tend to get guys in and train them up. So the, the standard of guides that they produced um, year after year are really, really good. So you're almost guaranteed that if you're going to go to one of these lodges, you're going to get a fantastic sort of guided experience. Um, and that then just gets enhanced by, by us being there as well, helping you. It, it gives us the freedom to then just focus on your photographic needs. We won't have to sort of do anything with the guides or, or help them positioning the vehicle. They get a lot of photographers coming in here, especially at, um, at Kahingo and in Sefu actually as well. So they, they kind of, they get used to what photographers want um, and what kind of um, images and positioning we want um, during our time there. So that really helps a lot. Here's a, another image from um, the experience we had last year actually. So this hippo died in the river, um, I'm not sure if the lions took it down or if it died from natural causes or from a fight with, the, with another hippo, but we had these lionesses 
in the water. And at one stage, like there were crocs and lions having this tug of war between them. So, I mean, it's, like I said, it doesn't happen around every corner, but it, every single time I've been to South Luangwa, there's always been something that like, just blows you away and, you, and um, just, like, it's just wild, really, really wild. So this is quite interesting. If, um, if you don't like canoeing, then um, this probably won't be for you. But this is us going down to the, the Carmine B side. This is from Kahingo Camp. So you drive a little bit. And then you get, it's, I mean, as you can see, Patrick and them are walking across. So um, that's Patrick at the back there. Um, you walk across to this, to this B to hide. And then they've got like an old boat that they've got put blinds around it, right against the banks of the river. And, you know, this is like um, incredible morning activity. You, know, you can literally spend the whole morning photographing those, those coal mine bee eaters. As you can see at the back, so there's the there's the little hide there. So you, you you go with the canoe, jump in there. There's a little table where you can put your cameras and things down. And then you you right up maybe I don't know five ten meters max from the banks of the river. So you can get up really really close to these birds, which in a way kind of makes it a little bit harder because you're so much closer. So that movement gets exaggerated quite a bit. But there's beautiful morning light falling onto that. Um, that riverbank. So great time to to photograph those beaters. Like I mentioned, it's very frustrating. You definitely do not nail every single shot, and you do take a lot of photos during this morning. That I can promise you. But it's a it's a lot of fun and super rewarding when you do get um, you do get something you like. This is another as another video just to um, just to give you an idea. So like I mentioned. You have some of the guys in the nest here, then you've got others going out, getting food, bringing it back in. So it's often best just to focus in one area and then wait for that action to happen and then fire away. Because um, yeah, if you, you try to follow these birds while they're flying, man, it is, it is literally impossible. Yeah, so very pretty birds, a lot of fun, um, and definitely, definitely one of the highlights during the trip. Then this is the the hippo hide. So this will do in the afternoon. This is the afternoon activity, and then what we'll do is that the so you'll park the vehicle up next to the tumat mountain. There is a little tunnel that you then walk underneath, and you get onto eye level then with these hippos. Now what we'll do is um, the guide, whoever's guiding us, will have a handheld radio with him just to sort of scan if there's anything else happening in the area. Um, and we, we don't really set a particular day for this. We, I usually try and if there's nothing happening, do it on like day two or day three, just depending on what we've seen um, leading up to um, our time at, uh, at Kahingo. But I try and get it out, out the way early because often if you leave it sort of towards the last few days, then you get a leopard and you want to stay with a leopard. You never got to do the, the, the hippos. It is a great experience. It is something cool to do. But you know, that's why we, we've moved Kanga to five nights instead of four, because often we find ourselves so pressurized to, you know, there's leopards and there's lions, but you still want to get to the hippos. You end up not sort of too sure where to go and what to do. So um, the hippo hide would definitely definitely do um, late in the afternoon one of these days. And this is the kind of stuff that you, not that you will get, but what you can get. And the, the hippos during this time of the year, because the water is so low, tend to get super aggressive. They, they, the strongest, they, they fight for those main bodies of water. With the weaker ones, they get pushed through the smaller little channels, um, little water. Some of them even don't have any water. So that's when they really start losing condition very quickly. They, their skin starts cracking up um, and then they get weaker, they dehydrate and end up you know, getting very weak. That's when lions and um, other lions kill them or they end up starving. Okay, then from there, I'd, like five nights at Kahingo, then we'll go by road, road transfer, all the way down to Mfui camp. So 
We usually do this as a like a morning game drive kind of activity. So pack all our, all our bags and everything in the morning and do a slow game drive, uh, sometimes even three or four hours to Mfui um, and then be there in time for like a brunch or lunch, um, depending on what they offer. Also Mfui camp, um, you'll see it's, I think it's the, quite a, like the perfect way to, to end off the, the safari. So we'll do three nights here. Um, and it, it, it is a little bit bigger, it is a little bit more, excuse me, a little bit more hotel-like almost, but it does come with a bit of luxury. So they've got air-conditioned rooms, which is, is absolute bliss during, um, during the hot time of the year. Um, but it's also like, like you can see a bit of, bit, of, bit of luxury there as well. But it's also nice and close to the airport for, um, for when we leave. And then also Mfui, I don't know if you guys have seen some of the photos, but it's very well known for this, for elephants walking. That's not a statue, that's actual real elephant walking through that reception area. So um, that's one of the things that Mfui is pretty well known for, to have those elephants walking through the reception, which I think is quite an experience. You know, it's, these elephants are by no, by no means tame or sort of hand raised or anything. They just, that probably used to be like a, a game path. I mean, you could argue that they shouldn't have built it there. Long story short, but I mean, um, the herds still move through there and, you know, they, they've sort of become accustomed to, to people being there, which I think is, is quite incredible. So if you, in case you leave your, uh, your room keys anywhere, um, they might go missing. <laughs> and then of course, that Mfui area is also, very, very well known for uh, for the good leopard viewing. You probably, maybe the only downside of, of Mfui is you might get a little bit more uh, traffic just because it's so close to the gate. You can get more um, self-drive vehicles cruising through there. But apart from that, you know, you, like we've never been sort of rushed in sightings or sort of been overcrowded where you have 20 or 30 cars there as such. So, Still incredible experience, incredible part of it. And then from there to, um, on our way back to Mfui Airport, it's probably about a 40 minute, 40, 45 minute drive. We usually do that also early in the morning, just because, you know, it gets so hot during that time of the year. You don't want to be flying sort of midday or two o'clock in the afternoon. It gets, gets pretty bumpy. So we usually fly out, land at uh, Lusaka between 10, 10 and 11.30, which then gives you enough time to then either catch like an afternoon flight out um, of Lusaka, or then if you have a night flight, then we can book you a day room again at the Pratia Hotel. The Lusaka airport, I promise you, there's nothing fancy about it, apart from a little coffee shop, which um, basically serves stock standard coffee and that's about it and very dry muffins but yeah so it's, it's not a place you want to be stuck for five or six hours so our logistics team um, judy and them will make sure that if you've got a longer than sort of three hour layover at the at the airport we'll book you into a day room in lusaka and it's just a lot more comfortable you can have a shower and a conditioned room and you can watch a bit of tv or relax by the pool whatever it may be so that'll be That'll be our recommendation to you is, um, yeah, if you've got a long, longer layover than three hours, then rather, rather book a day room. Otherwise, yeah, I've been stuck in Lusaka with delayed flights. It ain't pretty, that's for sure. Guys, that, that's about it from, from my side. Feel free, if you have any questions, feel free to, to send them through. I'd love to. I saw there were a few comments, but obviously with me bombing out, I think I missed them. So if you, if you did answer or if you did ask a question, please, Feel free to send it through again if I didn't reply to it. Um, Martha, October 2021 cannot come too soon. I agree with you, Martha. It's, um, it's a real sort of stab in the chest for me to be able to, um, well, missing Madagascar where I should have been now and then also missing South Luangwa. It's It was two really big ones for me. I hate missing South Luangwa. Um, Dates for 2022, Jan. Um, we have got dates available. It's, we haven't costed it yet, but the dates will be 
I'll have to think from, but they, they are available. They're not on our website yet. Um, Jan, send me, send me an email. I don't know if you have, um, if you have my email address, I'll send it through to you here. Just um, send me an email and then I'll get those dates through to you. We actually currently, it's, it's crazy to think, but with this whole um, coronavirus thing and stuff, we, 2022 is already pretty much done. I think we're waiting for four more um, safari crossings to take place. And then we're looking at, um, as of next week, uh, we're going to be starting with 2023 safaris. Um, it sounds crazy, I know, but I think, you know, from just putting people's mind to ease, you know, a lot of people are still uncertain about traveling next year, although I think it's going to be going to be fine sort of towards from about April, May. And um, next year, I think we, we're going to be good. But, you know, 2022, people are starting to feel a bit more comfortable to, to book that. And then 2023, even more so. So we are starting to look at that and um, be, be sure to stay tuned for the next couple of months. That's what I'm saying. There'll be, there'll be a lot of new things coming out and um, a lot of exciting things, things that we can't wait to share with you. Linda, yeah, can't wait to, can't wait to share South Hawanga with you. I think you're in for a great time there. Tim asks, is off-roading driving the norm there if you are in a private concession? Um, Tim, yes, it, it's, a, it's a bit of an interesting one to answer because, you know, if you speak to the park authorities, they say that off-roading is not permitted, although for like four high profile species. So if you have a leopard or lions or wild dogs, something like that, then the guys do go off road, yes. But um, it has to be, I mean, we, we don't put any pressure on the guides. So it's, it has to be, it has to make sense. Um, you know, if a leopard is in a thick bush and you can just see two ears, there's no point of sort of bashing through the bushes and breaking down trees just to get a glimpse of two ears um, in, in the thickets. If it's in a beautiful sausage tree or something like that, then of course, you know, that's, that's worth doing. But um, so like the yeah, bottom line is you can go off-road, but um, you know, the guys are, are very sensible about it and we just make sure we don't put any pressure on them um, to do so. But you know, for, if, if it's a good sighting, absolutely, the guys will, will definitely go off road. <clears throat> All right, any more questions? We will give another five minutes or so. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thanks, Wendy, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks for giving me some, some of your time. I bet you there's probably no South Africans on here because they're all probably brying somewhere or doing something crazy. <laughs> thank you, Elena. Really appreciate it. And thank you so much for your support with all the online tuitions and stuff that you've been doing. I know you've been doing quite a few things with Mike. Thank you so much for your support. Really appreciate it. Um, and deep is South Wangwa better for leopard sightings versus Sabi Sands? Um, Sandeep, I, I think I would, I would say Sabi Sands is probably a bit better, but purely, purely because of the amount of vehicles that, that are traversing in a relatively smaller area. If you're talking pure density, um, leopards per square kilometer, South Wangwa has more leopards, um, but it doesn't have nearly as many vehicles as you have in the Sabi Sands, if that makes sense. So um, probably, you know, like another argument then for South Wangwa is if you find a leopard, stay with it for as long as you want. Whereas often in the Sabi Sands, depending which lodge you're staying at, you could be, again, depending how busy the lodge is. So um, I think um, Sabi Sands, is, you've got a better chance of seeing them at Sabi Sands, but I think you, you've got better sightings at South Luang, where that makes sense. Better, better quality sightings, I think.
Happy Heritage Day. Thank you so much, Linda. And um, Linda, we were actually talking about you the other day when we, last weekend, when we did a leg of lamb on the spit. We'll definitely have to do one when you come visit, that's for sure. Wendy, look forward to visiting Africa in 21 or 2022. We can't wait to have you, Wendy. It's, um, like I said, a lot of positive vibes. And um, the 1st of October, we will have a, a better understanding of when we can travel. But I'm confident it's still going to be something towards the end of the year. I really am. Hoping for the best. Many thanks for your time, holiday. Thank you very much, Tim. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. We'll travel safe. Thank you so much. Um, with the distance and the time to travel there, what would you be a good companion location to couple with with this tour? Um, Elizabeth, you can do quite a few. So you can do uh, monopools. Monopools is a, is a great combination. Um, I think Martha and I are doing Malawi before before the trip, and then I'm actually doing monopools afterwards with Linda. So, yeah. Um, also, the the Lower Zambezi National Park in Zambia is also also really really good. Um, yeah, so I mean any, anything in, in Zimbabwe you can you can do Botswana even, um, or you could you know with a one night layover in South Africa or in Johannesburg, you can combine any lodge or any reserve in South Africa, whether it be Madikwe, Sabi Sands. You can actually do that. That would be incredible if you could do um, South Luangwa overnight in Johannesburg for one night, and then you do the Sabi Sands. That could be like the ultimate leopard safari experience. <laughs> How many people um, do you lead each group? So Wendy, we, we've um, brought up to five people. We used to do uh, four people, but the costs of, um, of a lot of these lodges have become really, really high. So we're trying to, um, we're now taking five, so five and one, so six people on a vehicle, which I still don't think it's a lot. You know, it's, it's two people per row, um, and one person can sit in front as well next to the guide. So I think it's, um, I don't think we'll go more than five. If we do, then we'll do two vehicles, but then costs, you know, costs for private vehicles really become very, very expensive in a lot of these parts. So we would like, we move the two to five people, not, um, not to, um, sorry, I've got a <laughs> little boy that, uh, that wants to go fishing this afternoon. Sorry about that. Um, so we've only brought it to, to five people purely for the sake of you know, making the, the cost like more sense. All right. Okay, you can go now. I'll, I'll, come, I'll come just now. <laughs> he's very stoked. He caught a fish this morning, so he's very stoked, very happy. Can't get that smile off his face. <laughs> All right, guys, I think that's, um, that's about it from my side, unless there's any last few questions. Once again, thank you so much for your time. Um, hope this has intrigued you a little bit about South Lamangu. If you have any more questions, feel free to send me an email. It's johan at wilder.co.za or send me a message on Instagram, Johan von Self Photography. You can send me a DM there. Happy to answer any questions that you might have. It's an incredible destination. It's a must -see, And it's a place that I think you would really, really love. So again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for all your support. There's a few more webinars coming up in the next few weeks. So stay tuned. And uh, we'll catch up with you guys then. Till next time. Cheers. <laughs>